Today we're going to be discussing the video capabilities of the Nikon Z9, because despite it being Nikon's new flagship photo camera with impressive specs in that category, it's also their best video camera to date, and arguably the most powerful video camera in the mirrorless market. Let's get undone. What is happening, everybody? I'm Gerald and Dunn, and I'm done doing those user commented intros. A little throwback there to the old intro and the greeting for the fans that have been asking for it for a while. But on to the disclosure, Nikon lent me this production Z9 to make this review, as well as the 35mm f1.8 lens. I also borrowed the 70 to 200 millimeter lens from Camera Canada, so big thank you to them. I don't get to keep any of the gear, no money changed hands, and Nikon doesn't get any input on this video's production or get to preview it before it's posted. This video does have a sponsor though, and that's Storyblocks. All right, let's start off by addressing my video concerns of the last Nikon camera review, the Z6 II, and see if any of those issues have been fixed here. Ergonomics will be familiar to Nikon shooters, and there's no shortage of buttons here on the Z9. I do still wish that the D-pad on the back was a wheel for mapping to ISO, which is a problem I had on the Z6. But overall, the controls are decent. The menus haven't changed, which is still a pain point for me. The design is the same, there's just now even more options for this camera, which is good, but they can still be hard to find sometimes. The biggest issue I have ergonomically is the accidental presses of buttons, like with this little guy on the side here. My palm hits it sometimes when I'm supporting the lens, and there's no way to disable it in the menu, and depending on your setting, it can actually stop your recording. I'd like Nikon to add an off option for this button, and the same is also true, albeit to a lesser extent, for the portrait shutter button as well, which you can accidentally hit if you have bigger hands. I've also been finding the memory card door to be very stiff and hard to open with one hand from behind the camera. I can definitely push it from the front easily, but when it's on a tripod from behind, I kind of find that it requires two hands without messing up your shot. Lastly, this camera is heavy and not just because of this pro body form factor. I recently had the Canon R3, which is also a big camera, but it felt significantly lighter in the hands. This Z9 weighs 1,340 grams, or about three pounds, and after a bit of shooting, you really start to feel it, especially if it's paired with a 7200 f2.8, which is also a comparably hefty lens. I have found that the weight does help with stabilization, and it does feel well-built. It's basically a tank, and even though it doesn't have a mechanical shutter, it still has a sensor protector, which I appreciate. I am noticing now, though, that I'm trying to be quiet for the video, that the strap loops here are the rattly variety. It has dual card slots for CF Express Type B, which you can use for backup recording and photo, but sadly still not in video. However, you can record both internally and externally at the same time. And the camera gives you the options for enabling menus and on-screen display information on the external monitor, even in 4K, without either screen blacking out in any combination. This is something that Sony and Canon still haven't mastered yet, so I was happy to see it. And the HDMI port is a full-size Type A, which is a step up from the Z6 and even the Canon R3. And they also fixed the output lag issue on the Z6, so now the HDMI and LCD are now in sync visually and respond quickly. The screen is better as well compared to the Z6. Its range of motion has been improved on the main axis, and they added a portrait tilt as well, which is handy for getting those low or high vertical shots. However, despite all those fixes, you still can't use focus peaking and zebras at the same time, just like on the Z6. They have added some functionality for manual focus, but right now it only works on certain lenses and there appears to be some bugs. For instance, there's an option to enable or disable a focus override that allows you to manual focus at any time during autofocus by just turning the focus ring. But it only works on certain lenses and it seems to be bugged. At least on the 7200, even if I disable the override in the menu, turning the focus ring even accidentally disables autofocus temporarily. This causes problems and needs to be fixed as soon as possible. The other new function is the ability to program a linear focus and throw distance in degrees. This option is fantastic and much needed. It offers a great amount of customization and makes Nikon viable for manual focusing. However, currently, I believe it's only available when using the 7200. I'd like to see this expanded to the entire lens lineup. The USB-C port supports power delivery, which works to charge the camera while off, but also to slow the battery's discharge while in use. With USB PD connected, you can run this camera for several hours. But even on just battery power, I found the runtime on this camera impressive. I was averaging close to three hours of 8K recording on this monster with a full charge, which is exceptional battery life, and all without any signs of overheating. It doesn't even really get warm. And thankfully, Nikon got rid of the 30 minute record limit from the Z6, but they replaced it with a two hour and five minute one. This I have no explanation for. Why two hours and five minutes? At first I thought it was the capacity of my card, but it's happening with bigger cards too, and it's even listed on the official spec sheet. You can do back-to-back -back recordings at that length, and the camera doesn't seem to shut down or overheat, so it's a weird limit. Maybe it's just to be overly precautious. It doesn't matter the record mode either. 
4K 24, 8K 30, 4K 60, all two hours and five minutes. So as long as your recordings don't need to be longer than two hours, this is the most stable and reliable hybrid video camera I've tested, especially when it comes to 8K or high frame rate recording. And of course, you can exceed that two hour limit if you record externally. I also like how Nikon has laid out the resolution and frame rates. It doesn't matter whether you shoot PAL or NTSC, you can just pick a frame rate you want from a list. However, there aren't options for DCI or True 24P. Jumping into autofocus, I'd say it feels slightly improved over the Z6 II. It still suffers a bit with low light. I find that once you get down past about three stops underexposed, it becomes really unreliable, even while shooting at f2.8. But overexposure is not an issue. You can keep focus even when your subject is completely nuclear. Lens choice makes a huge difference here though. On the 35 f1.8, I'd say the autofocus was decent at best, but on the 70-200, it was mostly excellent and would be a reliable choice in my opinion. That's probably the biggest hurdle with Nikon right now is the inconsistency in lens performance, selection, and functionality in the menu when it comes to focusing. I do like all the tracking options it has in video though. You can track people with eye detection, animals with eye detection, and vehicles, and it has an auto mode to intelligently switch between them, which has worked reliably for me. It's got 3.5 millimeter ports for microphone in and headphone out, and control in the menu for microphone level, frequency range, and an attenuator for hotter mics. It cannot accept a line level signal though from my testing. But we can test an on-camera shotgun mic to see how it sounds with the microphone doing the heavy lifting and setting the internal gain on the camera to its minimum. Let's test that now while I tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks. Okay, here we go. So I've got the Rode VideoMic NTG set up on top of the camera. I've got the camera set to one, which is the minimum gain. We're in the wide frequency range, attenuators off, that just proof that it's mic here that we're listening to. Now, obviously this mic isn't gonna sound the same as my Sennheiser up here, but it should give you an idea of how clean we can get the preamps to sound. So sometimes you don't have the shot you need and there's no way you're gonna be able to go out and get it before you run out of time, run out of money, or run out of patience by completely derailing your creative momentum. And that's where Storyblocks comes in. They've got subscriptions for every budget that give you access to a vast royalty-free library with unlimited downloads, allowing you to use the footage worry-free for both personal and commercial projects. They're also focused on enriching their catalog with diverse and inclusive content to provide useful assets to creatives with varying needs and audiences. And this is all easily accessed using their intuitive interface with filters for 4K video at multiple frame rates along with backgrounds and After Effects templates. If you've never browsed Storyblocks before, I think you'll be truly impressed by just how exhaustive their library is. And I encourage you to learn more about them by using the link in the description below. Ibis feels good on this camera. This isn't a vlogging camera and you're not gonna get gimbal results, but the combination of the weight of the system mixed with the Ibis controls make for a good human tripod experience. I prefer the sport mode though over the normal as I found it fought me less and moved better with me if I was tracking a subject or panning. It also has an electronic VR which adds a crop, but I didn't care for this mode. I found just the sport mode plus a stabilized lens like the 7200 gave great results. I was hand holding at 200 millimeters and found the shots looked quite steady. All of my test shots are at 24p as well, so you can see the shakes instead of hiding them in slow motion. Rolling shutter exists on this camera, but it definitely falls in the pass category, in my opinion. It's similar to that of the Sony A1 or Canon R3. In fact, it might be a tiny bit better, but definitely usable. It's only really noticeable in the 8K readout modes, so 8K up to 30p and 4K oversampled up to 30p. The 60p and 120p 4K modes are much faster reading because they don't oversample, so rolling shutter is not an issue with them. And you also have the option to crop in camera to Nikon DX if you want, which will likely improve rolling shutter for the 4K modes. But again, the full frame oversampled rolling shutter is solid and gets a pass. Fun fact regarding that oversampling and external recording. As I've mentioned in other videos, the way I currently use my Sony A1 is I set the camera to 8K internal, but then I record externally to an Atomos Ninja 5, which ends up creating an oversampled 4K image externally. You can also do this on the Nikon Z9. However, it won't let you record internally during this mode. In fact, you have to physically remove the cards from the camera to enable this. Otherwise, if you have the camera set to 8K internally with cards in the camera and HDMI connected, the HDMI output defaults on a 1080p. But as soon as you remove the cards, it goes to 4K externally and it seems to be a much cleaner oversampled image. This is quirky, but potentially useful if you don't want to record ProRes internally. But how cool is it that you can record ProRes internally on this camera? The only reason I'd go the Ninja 5 route on this camera is the cost savings on SSDs versus CF Express cards. But it's impressive how self-reliant the Z9 is. Lastly, on the oversampling front, here are some images of the different recording modes showing the quality gained or lost depending on resolution and frame rate. The 4K 60 and 120 do lose some sharpness, but it isn't anything that makes those modes not worth using. They're all still quite viable and look great and maintain the dynamic range. 
Strangely, there is a difference in dynamic range between the H265 recordings and the ProRes recordings. The H265 are averaging about half a stop better, and I think this can be attributed to the character of the noise in those modes. The H265 seems to have either a more aggressive noise reduction or it manages to mask the noise better through compression, because the highlight retention between the two codecs is the same, but H265 scores slightly cleaner, according to Imatest. It also scores cleaner when compared to the external recordings. Both external and internal ProRes match and are half a stop worse for noise than H265 internal. But when I went back and looked at the charts, I didn't find that the H265 had any less detail than the ProRes. So it's not like the noise reduction is so aggressive that it's hurting detail. So as far as I can tell, it's a viable way to clean up your shadows a touch in camera. I just don't know the specifics of what's going on with that process. But anyway, when testing using the Zilei 21, I averaged around 12 stops of usable dynamic range, slightly lower on ProRes and slightly higher on H.265. I do think though that this score is slightly limited by N-Log. N-Log seems to suffer from the same shortcomings that other manufacturers first log profile did, just like Canon Log 1 or S-Log. We need an N-Log 2 with expanded dynamic range for cameras that are capable like the Z9 surely is. But this might be less important when Nikon releases the upcoming RAW update for the Z9 if it allows us to decode to a different log profile of our choosing in post. I'll test that update when it's available and I'll let you know. But in its current state, 12 stops of dynamic range is passable. It's not the best in the mirrorless world, but it certainly isn't the worst and can definitely get the job done. Color-wise, N-Log is good. Well, the Z9 is good in general. I feel the same way I feel about the Z6 II. You've got two great options. Nikon's flat profile is one of the best in the game for mostly finished image that offers great looking, accurate color that can just use a contrast tweak to your taste in post. And then N-Log is viable now that Nikon has been updating their LUT. They have a Z9 version available for download as well. It can be a bit punchy at times, but if you expose neutrally, it can give you a great looking image in one step. Alternatively, if you like to ETTR, then the Leaming LUT for Nikon still works reasonably well on the Z9 and also gives a great look. Regarding exposure, I was quite pleased with the results while moving through the ISO range. Noise is well controlled at most stops and is usable up to and beyond ISO 12800. It does appear to clean up at ISO 4000, which I'm going to assume is a second native ISO. I'll be able to confirm this again when I get the raw update, but it definitely performs like a second native ISO. But detail, color integrity, and tone were all well maintained while moving up in ISO, and I have no complaints about that. Obviously, you're still gonna get better noise performance by overexposing, but I'd have no concerns using this camera in low light with neutral exposure, other than the aforementioned autofocus limitations. And that's pretty much it. There's some minor things I could be picky about. I wish there was a tally light, for example, as without a front-facing screen, it's difficult to know if you're recording when self-filming, but mostly, this is a fantastic camera. It doesn't fail in any category. It's an extremely robust and reliable machine that passes or excels in all areas. It has a couple ergonomic hurdles, but this is an incredibly impressive release from Nikon, who up until this point weren't that competitive when it came to video. Well, that claim no longer stands because with the Z9, Nikon has one of, if not the best hybrid mirrorless camera available for video. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure to leave the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, try setting the playback speed to 75%. Yeah, all right. I'm done. <laughs>